Brother Ray Angus, um, Sovereign Grace Independent Missionary Baptist Church, coming to you from Millington, Tennessee. Uh, it switched over here to our uh, prayer list. I think if I didn't delete everything. All right. Brother Landon had asked us to pray last week uh, for the officers that he works with were involved in a shooting. And uh, normally he would have been there on duty, he said at that time, but uh, Wendy was having the baby Cooper. And so he asked us to remember these men in prayer. It's, uh, you know, not an easy thing to have to take a life like that. Uh, we keep Wendy and Cooper in our prayers. He uh, appears to be a very healthy young man. Uh, Blake and Jessica have a young one on the way, a little girl. We have a date approximately. Mm -hmm. okay. No. No date yet? Okay. Um, my niece, Jennifer, asked us to remember her great uncle. Harry Biggs, who was congestive heart failure. I have not heard an update. I need to check in with her on that. Uh, Will Wilson continues in our prayers. Got his stitches removed. All right, that's, that's Sister Betty's uh, brother-in-law. And Brother Kenny Guy remains on our prayer list again. I haven't heard from him. Uh, I see him post occasionally. Continue to remember uh, the suffering that's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's just hard to imagine the terrible things that are going on there. Uh, Brother Dale Wallace remains in our prayers. Uh, Brother Kenny Davison uh, asked us to remember him in prayer. Frank Craig and family, uh, Brother Paul Brown and family. Uh, my great 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 nephew Weston, who has serious illness, they're uh, going to put him on some strong antibiotics and try to get him a little bit older before they do surgery. Remembering our missionaries, Pat Diane Horner, uh, Eric Danala in Africa, we recently uh, started supporting him, uh, Edwin Chapala, also in Africa. Paul and Susan Brown in Thailand. Matthew and Brittany Volandry also in Thailand along with their children. Uh, Peter Howman is back in New Guinea. Uh, hadn't slept in three days, he said, and he still had 12 hour drive to go. And his first, the last I heard was he was making sure his car was running properly before he headed out. And they don't have to travel that many miles, but, but the roads, uh, I think they said average 15 miles per hour. So you can imagine how, how far he has to go in 12 hours. Cecil and Denise Fayard. And by the way, Peter Heilman is not a missionary that I wish to visit on the mission field. I don't think I'm strong enough for, for such a trip. Andreas and Rhonda Galvez and their daughter Damaris in uh, Mexico. Uh, Bert Kraft and family also in Mexico. Any other prayer requests this morning? Uh, the young man up in West Virginia that my daughter told us about is doing much better. The one that's involved so in that. He's off the, his ventilator and he's right. breathing on his own. And uh, he's using both sides and uh, recognizing movement of people. All right. This Improving. one is in serious car accident up there. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, doing better. And of course, we have lots of family that are, I guess, elderly would be part of the description. But uh, Elaine has aunts and uncles and friends that are in serious health issues. Uh, I wish your friends were dying on. 
Uh, Diane is usually online here. If not, she catches us later, but she wouldn't mind us remember her in our prayers. All right. We'll have Brother, uh, Sister Diane Owens to our prayer list here. Yeah. All right. Any other prayer request? I'm going to ask Brother Kenny to come and lead us in some prayer and lead us in some songs. Good morning. Good to be with everybody this Sunday morning. Uh, I want to thank the Lord for the opportunity to lead the singing and uh, be of use to him. Uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> have a couple of songs here in a minute. And uh, in our hymnal, what is this? All-American hymnal. We're going to sing 305 and 307. That's, must Jesus bear the cross alone? And the one after that will be Revive Us Again. <clears throat> but uh, first, we want to have a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house today. We thank you for this Lord's Day. It's a great day to be here. Father, we ask you to bless our service today here at our church, at our assembly. We thank you for the ones that are here this morning, Lord, and just thank you for letting us be here. You're so good to us, Father, and we thank you for our lives and our family and our homes, all you give us, because you give us all. We thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus and the precious blood that he poured out at Calvary. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here today to worship him. Father, be merciful to us. Please forgive us for our sins and help us that we might do what's right in your sight, Lord. And that we might bear fruit to Jesus. Please bless Brother Ray this morning, Lord. Lift him up. Strengthen him and help him to stand there the time he's here and help him to preach your word and to teach your word and help each one of us that we might be lifted up before thy throne of grace. That we might have the strength in our bodies and in our hearts and in our souls, Lord, to live our life and, and go on and looking forward to the day we'll be at home with you. Lord, please save all those that we love that are lost. Be merciful to them, Lord. Touch the ones that I have in my mind that I've talked to them and worried over. Bless their hearts and bless their families and touch them, Lord, that they might come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Bless our service now, today, Lord, that, that we might be lifted up and that the Holy Spirit will touch us, strengthen us, guide us and direct us in the ways we should go. For it is in the precious and holy name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Okay, we're going to try to get a little musical thing going here. <laughs> sing some songs that we all know or a lot of us know most of us 
and uh, bring back some good old memories, really. We, I remember Elaine and her family and mine in the old Woodlawn on Woodlawn Terrace Baptist Church. But anyway, we're going to sing all four verses of Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone as we sing. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. <clears throat> the consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free. And then go home my crown to wear for there's a crown for me upon the crystal pavement down at Jesus' fierce feet. Joyful, I'll cast my golden crown and his dear name repeat. Oh, precious cross, oh, glorious crown, oh, resurrection day, ye angels come, the stars come down, and bear my soul away. Amen. I'm going to turn over. No, I ain't going to turn. I'm going to look over here at this next page. <laughs> Revive us again. First, second, and fourth verse. As we sing. We praise thee, O God. For the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. Let's do three. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and hath cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Line the glory. Revive us again. 
Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. We all need to be revived, don't we? Brother Ray, would you come and give us your message? All right, brother. Thank you. Bless you. Again, I do appreciate Brother Kenny leading. And uh, we are moving on to chapter four of First John, believe it or not. And this is the day of, of the year that people uh, refer to as Easter or the day of remembering our Lord's resurrection. Uh, personally, I believe that every Sunday commemorates our Lord's resurrection. And I'll not let you off so easy if you are twice a year church attenders. Uh, you're not to forsake the assembling of yourself together. It's, the matter of some is. And each Sunday should be uh, an appreciation and remembrance of the fact that our Lord arose from the grave on the first day of the week. We've looked at our prayer list and we want to touch off uh, again just a little bit on on uh, the basis of, of this epistle of 1 John. And it speaks in regards to uh, the responsibility and the duties of an apostle. And uh, by the end of that first century, the apostle John was the only one left of our Lord's disciples. And the church was being ass assaulted with heresy. And the heresy centered around the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it built off of several foundations uh, one of them is ancient Babylonian mysticism. And you still see this even in movies and references. And I'll see pictures hanging on the wall that have uh, a source of this mysticism. The idea that uh, uh, Satan and Jesus were God or were brothers, I should say, is part of it comes out of that mysticism, which there's no truth in that whatsoever. And of course, that's attacking the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, and so he opens up with this thought. But the other thing that, uh, and I spent a little bit of time reading different comments from different commentaries on, uh, and I would do a search on my computer here, and, and there'll be maybe one reference under each commentary. I didn't find more than one under any of them. And maybe I'm spending too much time on it, but uh, I think for us to understand the epistle of 1 John, we have to understand the attacks that were being made upon the church. And uh, I like the passage there. It says uh, they went out from us for they were not of us. And that was a blessing to that first century church. But even more so today, uh, I deal with a lot of different backgrounds in the prison ministry. And sometimes the men will quit coming because they'll get the arguing among themselves and uh, sometimes they'll ask me a question, try to settle an argument. And I wish they wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned it to them Friday night. That I, I, I really do not want them to use my comments on a subject matter to try to settle an argument because it ends up being hard feelings uh, among the men. But at the same time, I'm very clear on what I believe and what I teach. Uh, saying that, uh, I hand out the... the uh, handouts that I get. I get about 20 copies uh, from uh, Mount Zion and Pens uh, Pensacola every three months. And I get about 20 copies from uh, the Central Baptist Church there in Grenada. And I'll carry in. Uh, I'll leave some for the church members and then I'll carry the rest into the prison. And one of the inmates said, uh, Friday night that he said, well, there were some things in there that I didn't agree with. 
And I said, well, there's probably things in there that I don't agree with too. These men are for all different backgrounds. Most of them have died. Many of them were Puritans from the 17, 1800s, maybe even earlier. But at the same time, uh, and I, I'll tell them this, and I reminded them again, uh, you don't accept what I say uh, without going to the scripture and searching the scripture. I don't require you to hook, line, and sinker accept everything I can say unless I can show scripture for it. And that you have that responsibility, and I'll say the same thing to our church members, uh, you have the responsibility to search the scriptures. One of the things that I've been amazed at, and I've seen this several times in churches when they break up, is the pastor had been teaching and leading and instructing in uh, what the scripture taught. But uh, when it comes time to find a new pastor, they don't necessarily want to follow what uh, had been taught through the years uh, as if it had no meaning or no consequences whatsoever in their lives. And, uh, uh, and so I think there is a sense in which uh, starting a new gives a challenge to the members in a new church to uh, spend a little more time in the scripture and to set themselves up. Uh, at the same time, I re recognize that I won't always be here at this church. There will come a time when I'll pass on, either mentally or physically or both. And there will be a need then for someone else to step up. And the Lord will provide and as he provides, it provides an opportunity to refresh in their minds what they believe and what they practice, that is, the church members, and to strengthen uh, their understanding as they search for a new pastor. Uh, historically, our churches would call ministers from amongst them, uh, and uh, we'd like to see the same thing happen here. But uh, when Brother Larry died suddenly, uh, uh, and for three years, I was interim pastor, and it was made very clear to me that I was the interim pastor, which I was fine with, but uh, never could find someone to lead that we thought would lead in the direction that we would uh, historically have been uh, led in, and um, it may have been a, uh, too far to go or too much to expect. But keeping that in mind, then, John is dealing with heresy that's entering into this early church. And as an apostle, they were taught by our Lord and they were given responsibility to set things in order in the early church. Uh, we think of church today as the same old six and seven. Uh, and you have so many different churches and so many different views. A lot of it is basically entertainment of the flesh these days. Uh, doctrine seems to be a mi minor issue, not an important issue. But the important thing in my mind is, what does the scripture say? What did the scripture teach? For this is God speaking to us, not philosophers, not uh, the opinion of someone else. It's written. And as this man said, there's some things in there. He didn't agree with the article that I handed out to him. I said, that's fine. You search the scripture. It's your responsibility. Uh, to search the scripture and know what the scripture teaches. And the same thing is true today, that we need to go back to the scripture and we need to realign ourselves with the word of God. And so I start off this first verse in chapter one, verse one, and uh, I handed out some notes, but you'll find that the first page was not copied. So uh, you, you won't be able to follow me on this first page. But first John 1, 1, and which we hear here, uh, uh, that which was from the beginning. And he's speaking about the eternality of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the fact that he was fully God and yet fully man, that he laid aside his glory, that he took upon himself flesh, that he was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin, that he suffered and bled and died, that his father turned away from him as he hung there on the tree because he became sin for us, who knew no sin, that he died, he was buried, and that hit the third day he arose. And today, that's not the end of it. He is making intercession for us, and he doesn't sleep. We got to note that Brother Peter had been uh, traveling for three days and hadn't slept. Well, our Lord never sleeps. While we sleep, he is always at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. 
And we read in chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit. And you could take the word spirit there and, and believe not every doctrine or every teaching that's out there. A long time ago, and the Old Testament supports this, that kingdoms will have a king, but they'll also have a demonic spirit behind the king. We would say in, in Russia right now, we have Putin, and then we would have a demonic spirit that's behind him. And we could say so, pretty much so, for North Korea, for China, and for many other countries. And in our country, my opinion is, and this is my opinion, that we have leaders that have uh, demonic spirits behind them at time, and we have leaders that have uh, good angels or good spirits behind them. And so it seems to fluctuate him. Uh, it goes from one good one to one bad one, um, maybe several bad ones, and then we'd get a good one uh, from you know my viewpoint, my stance in regards to this. And what would be a good one? One that would hold to the things of God's word, the principles of, of what this country was supposed to be built upon, Judeo-Christian ethic. And, uh, and so we spend, and this portion of scripture tells us not to believe every spirit, not to follow every spirit, and it tells us, uh, previously, and uh, uh, that there are many antichrists back in chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And elsewhere, it tells us that there are many antichrists. And, and so uh, he's dealing with, again, demonic spirits that uh, were behind uh, some of these leaders, and they're listed. I don't know if I can pronounce all the names, but I know that one was Serentius, uh, one was uh, Nicolaus, uh, and uh, Simon Magnus, which is, you'll find reference to him in scripture, uh, Ebion, uh, and in the teaching of the Gnostics. And, uh, uh, I don't know if I mentioned Nicolaus already, but these are just a few of, of those that sought leadership, uh, that taught false doctrine, and you always recognize demonic teachings because they always deny the divinity of Christ. Just a very simple test. What do you say about Christ? And our Lord asked his disciples, he, he said, well, who do men say that I am? And, and they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others say you're prophets from the Old Testament. But he says unto them, who do you say that I am? And that's the acid test. Returning back to chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Now, John's not writing to the pastors. He's writing to the churches. And he says the churches here, the church members, they're not to believe every doctrinal issue that comes forth that people who try to teach. Uh, and we see the same thing today. Uh, if I was to say one of the things that I notice in our churches is there's a attempt to be entertaining uh, with modern music and so forth, uh, entertaining the flesh pretty much. And and so you have people today that are at home with um, a certain type of music that is very much worldly. And then they try to bring that into the churches. And I'm not comfortable with that type of, of mess myself. I call it a mess. Uh, I, I like the hymns, Brother Kenny said they bring back memories. Brother Dale says about our hymns, he says there's no other religion that has uh, a system of hymnology as we as Christians do. Uh, and you, you can think about the, uh, the Muslims uh, or you can think about the Hindus or any other group. They do not have the song books like we do. They don't have the hymns. And uh, Brother Irvin Wallace was asked one time about a, a hymn. He says, uh, you know, is there hymns that perhaps are not scriptural in every point? And what do you think about that? And he says, don't think much of it uh, because they're hymns. They're not necessarily scripture. But for the most part, our, the hymns that we sing have very strong scriptural foundation. And, uh, and, I, and as I observe the hymns and as I listen to the hymns and sing the hymns, I'm amazed at the hymn writers that had such deep understanding of scripture and we're able to place in a written form uh, doctrinal messages. In fact, Brother Dale has at times preached messages from the hymn book because there was a strong foundation 
uh, in the scripture revealed in the hymns. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Is this spirit of God? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And we live in a generation where this has been multiplied. Uh, truth is very narrow and truth is usually very small. Uh, it will not necessarily be the humongous uh, churches and organizations that exist in the world. Uh, but as, when you stick with the scripture, you'll find it's not necessarily popular. Easy believism has pretty much destroyed our churches and destroyed many Christians. And there will be an accountability of ministers that have given false hope to people when they have led them down uh, what is referred to as a Roman road uh, and, and, and then pronounced that you're now saved. Uh, we can never pronounce anyone saved. That's a matter between them and God. We can examine the fruit and see if there's any evidence of salvation. But it's created an atmosphere in which there is a very shallow understanding of scripture, very shallow attendance to the worship, a very shallow responsibility in what they should and should not do. And so John says here in chapter four, that you are to try, you're to examine, you're to look. And again, when it talks about spirits, it's talking about those that teach false doctrine and that there's a demonic spirit behind them. Our Lord said to the Pharisees, you're your father, the devil. In other words, a demonic spirit was behind them in their beliefs and actions and behavior. Well, what type of spirit is behind us? We might ask ourselves in that regards. We might do self-examination and I do a lot of self-examination, questioning and asking myself. And, and part of the reason why I'm in First John is I'm doing a self-examination personally and encouraging others to do the same. John chapter five, verse 43, I come in my father's name and you receive me not. Our Lord Jesus Christ was sent from the father. We have an Old Testament example in Isaac, who uh, the Lord told Abraham to offer him up as a sacrifice. And here our Lord is speaking. He says, I come in my father's name. I come representing him. I come in obedience to him. Uh, I not come to do my own thing or my own will, but I come to do his will. And again, we might ask ourselves, are we those that are self-willed or are we those that are willing to do what the Lord would have us to do? And ye receive me not. And how, how do people react to the word of God? How do they react to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? How do they react to what the Bible teaches in regards to who he is? And, it, and it's a self-test. Do you receive him? What do you believe about Jesus? And if another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Well, turn on TV, turn on the evangelists, those that promote themselves. And, and you'll see that there is a tremendous reception. Uh, I remember reading an article one time, it may have been in Reader's Digest, uh, where they were interviewing this lady who was basically, I believe, an atheist was her background. But she went to a very popular evangelist and, and went to his services. And when asked why, she said, because uh, I get such a positive feeling when I'm there uh, that he teaches positive stuff. And therefore, I embrace uh, that spirit, even though I'm not a believer. Well, can you come to a church that teaches the word of God and embrace the person of our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, test again that, that you might ask yourself. Or 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, where the apostle Paul says, let no man deceive you by any means. Uh, I've talked about how the, uh, the Jehovah Witness will sometimes come and uh, and uh, they'll ask they'll they'll make a statement to it. Do you know that the Trinity is not in uh, the scripture? And and most Christians don't know that it's not. They know the teachings there, but they don't know the word Trinity is not there. And so they start arguing and they start searching the scripture and they can't find the word trinity uh and therefore it's been said that uh, a large portion of, of those people that are in cults were former baptists uh, they have never been uh, taught nor never embraced uh, the truth of god's word 
And I've often pointed out to you that the very first verse of Scripture teaches the Trinity. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word there, God, is Elohim, and it's plural. And in the Hebrew language, it meant three or more. And so the very first scripture teaches. Uh, and then you go on, it says, let us, plural, make man in our image, singular. Again, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a conversation. The Trinity taught there in the first book of Genesis. And, of course, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. But we read here, let no man deceive you by any means. And that's what they come to do, and they're trained. I'm thankful that I don't have many of them that come knocking on our door. Uh, did one time, and there was a young fella. I mean, he was a youngster, and he was with an older man. And he started giving their presentation, and I, I mentioned that, you know, that uh, something about cults, and it made the older man angry. And he took the young kid, and they left. And I was thankful that they left, but uh, uh, his reaction was kind of surprising to me. But they come to deceive. Uh, they come to draw you away from the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and to take you to a false system, a false system of works. I've mentioned to you when I come home on Friday night, I pass a meeting house of Jehovah Witness. And it's about nine o'clock when I get home on Friday night and that parking lot will be jam packed. And that particular uh, cult uh, teaches against the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, they have many people that are being led astray. Uh, many people that will wake up in hell and wonder how they got here and perhaps will argue, well, I was a member of this cult or, uh, you know, they might not refer to it as a cult, but I was a member of this group or I was a member of that group or I was baptized or I was a member of the church or I, I gave to different charities and different arguments that people would give. But the scripture tells us very clearly that there's only one way and that's through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he himself testified, I am the way. And he enlarges upon that and, and defines it even closer, the truth and the life and no man cometh unto the father but by me, not by church membership, not by baptism, but not even by doctrinal belief, uh, not by good works, not by charitable giving or whatever it is, but simply through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. What think ye of Christ? Well, again, back here in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And we very easily can say that perhaps we're in the midst of a falling away uh, in our country. Uh, one of the things that I always think about is that Paul wanted to go east and the Holy Spirit would not let him go east. He went west, which meant Rome, Spain, France, England, and eventually America. But today, where you see the Lord working the strongest is in places like Thailand, uh, perhaps Mexico, uh, Africa, South America, uh, not from the Western influences, but we send missionaries to these lands and then we hear of large meetings and people uh, being saved and joining the church. Uh, you don't see a lot of that here in this country today. Um, the, the Lord guided the Apostle Paul. And one of the things we deal in this generation now is if you want to study the scripture, you will find almost all the information so far as textbooks and whatnot are in the English language. Uh, th there was some German, there was some French. Most of these have been translated into the English language. But for the most part, one of the things missionaries often will do is they'll teach English so that these people will have access to a, a sound uh, copy of the scripture. Because often the, the, what scripture they might have in their languages is not necessarily very accurate. And, uh, and so uh, a beginning point and uh, missionaries that I know often uh, will start off with the English language so that they'll have access to uh, sound literature. But he goes on to say here, for that day shall come, except there come a falling away first. And, and I would think that would describe the generation in which we live. And that man of sin be revealed, which is 
uh, what is spoken of in Revelation. And uh, you would say that we see some revelation of that, again, with the demonic spirits that are behind some of the leaders of this, of this world. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have tentatively been set up to do is uh, to go to three different cities across uh, Mississippi and remove the money change machines out of Sam's. And my helper was with us the other day. We went down and checked out uh, at one of the jobs there in South Haven, Mississippi, and he likes their hot dogs. And he went up to get him a hot dog, and they wouldn't let him pay with cash. He had to use a card, and he didn't have a card. So I, I gave him my card so he could get his hot dog. But uh, it appears that they're going strictly to uh, plastic, to credit cards, in effect. Well, that's part of prophecy in regards to one world system coming up a cashless society and uh and we see these things going towards a, a one world government uh and we could see how very easily it can be brought about it goes on to describe this man of sin as the son of perdition who is he who opposes and exalteth himself above all if you remember that was satan's uh desire the reason why he was thrown out of heaven was that he had exalted himself and he wished to be above God. You realize when he was in the process of tempting our Lord, one of the things he asked the Lord to do is to fall down and worship him. And he said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. He wished to be worshiped. He wished to be exalted. He's one of three archangels that are mentioned in, skip, in scripture, uh, Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel. And he, uh, was cast out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And uh, they are not everywhere at all times, but they're very uh, often that we'll run into their influence. And they're one of the enemies that we have to deal with on a regular basis. And the description here of this man of perdition, this man of sin, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. He wishes to be worshipped. Again, we think about Eve. And a part of the temptation that was given to her is that if you'll eat of this fruit, God knows in the day that you eat of it that you'll be just like him. Uh, and that was part of the temptation there to, to be on equal footing with God, in effect. Here it, it is uh, to, to exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. And you might think of Jim Jones, if you're old enough, you might remember that, which took place in Guyana. At that time, a communist country, and we have a longtime missionary there uh, that is uh, on the opposite end of the country from where that took place. Uh, uh, Jim Jones and Jonestown or whatever it was called was close to Venezuela. And our missionary is on the opposite end of the, of, of the country. But he did not know anything about what took place there from inside the country. He had to find it from other sources outside of the country. Uh, but what was it that Jim Jones was about? Well, he was about making himself basically God. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Or Acts chapter 20, verse 29. Again, these are notes that did not print, and so uh, they're not going to be in your notes that I handed out. But Acts chapter 20, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Well, again, is that not an accurate description of, of the generation in which we live, in which you have those that wish to, to be in leadership, those that wish to be self-important in effect? They come in and they'll just scatter the sheep. They'll destroy the, the churches. And, and I've seen this happen several times. Uh, and, and you try to figure out what is it? And best I can figure out is that someone wants to be in control and wants to be looked up to. And they, sometimes it has to do with money, but not always. But uh, this is the description of what will happen. And it's, and it's still true today. It can happen in any particular church uh, that uh, these people come in and they enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Or Matthew 24, 24, where our Lord says the following. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 24. 
for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Again, uh, how much confusion exists in Christianity today? And when you start examining these different groups, what is it that they're seeking? Well, they're seeking uh, recognition. They're seeking power. They're seeking money. <laughs> Some of the brethren talk about, uh, you know, instead of me sending you money, why don't you send me money? You know, and, and of course, uh, these people in these large groups that are usually prosperity the ministries are not about to send you money, but they'll be sure to take your last nickel. But uh, this is what our Lord said that would happen after he departed. Uh, there'll be those that claim to be Christ. And this was true historically in, in the first century that there were many that rose up and called themselves the Messiah. And then there was those that were called false prophets. And he says, these prophets, these messiahs will show great signs and wonders and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Well, you think back about Moses when he went before Pharaoh and he cast down uh, his walking stick, basically, and it became a snake. And uh, Pharaoh had some uh, magicians there and they cast down their st sticks and they became snakes. And uh, he, Moses snake or basically ate up their snakes, um, showing who was in control and who was in power at that point. But uh, sometimes people will say, you know, you hear about these miracles. And, of course, there's been some that have been shown to be false and, and tricksters. But then there's others. Sometimes you wonder, how could they do the things that they did? Well, a long time ago, it was explained to me in, in several different ways. One explanation was that uh, a lot of times what they do is, is negative, not positive. Uh they they perhaps will say, well, they healed somebody. Uh, but if it was d dug into a little bit deeper, you might find that this person was being oppressed by a demon and it affected their health. And all Satan had to do is withdraw his demon and the person's health is restored. And so uh, it appears to be a miracle, but it's basically a removal of that demonic influence. And that's just one explanation. And, and I'm not going to say that I'm an expert in these areas, but I know that the scripture teaches and we have examples where demonic influences did miraculous things in the past. First John chapter two, verse 22, again, along the same lines here, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Antichrist and denies the father and the son. And, you know, again, cults, always recognize them by what they say about Jesus. And I, John goes into this, and, and then now he's back in verse uh, chapter 4, again on this subject matter of the Antichrist, or demonic spirits, or false prophets. And, and so he's picking up and enlarging upon this same theme that he's touched on several times already uh, in this epistle. Again, we read in First John chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist, opposed to Christ or against Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Well, back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, which I promised you we would uh, turn to uh, this morning and get started on. Uh, again, beloved, believe not every spirit. Uh, in regards to this, the spirit, again, it has reference to uh, teachings, uh, doctrinal matters. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Well, again, I do a self-examination. Does the spirit dwell within me? What do I believe about Christ? And, and uh, I, I do this on a regular basis, self-examination. Uh, the scripture says to make our calling and election sure. The last thing that we want to find out is when we wake up in eternity that we were misled or that we had not 
embraced our Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. Can you hear me above that rain? Yeah, it's coming down. Rain's coming down pretty hard now. Uh, he, he suggested this in the second chapter, and we just read that in chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, and verse 18 says, little children, it is the last time. And here John is elderly, the last of the apostles. And, uh, and it's been explained that the last 2,000 years is the last time. We no longer have uh, scripture being added to, although there's false doctrine that's added to it. We have the fact that we're waiting for the Lord's return. And I'm of the opinion that he can come at any point or at any time. And I mentioned this before. I remember a brother one time telling me the Lord just couldn't come until certain things happened. And uh, I'm not going to limit the Lord to my understanding of these things. I, I believe that we should be ready that he could come even so today. By every spirit means every doctrine. Uh, every teacher who professes to be qualified and sent by him, self-promotion, in other words. Uh, seen this through the years, and, and I watch it in men that uh, desire to uh, hold certain offices, and they become very skilled in, in presentation of themselves. And, uh, Dr. So-and-so and so forth and so on. If there was one positive thing that I remember, not the only thing, but my pastor uh, O.C. Harris, uh, he encouraged us to study the scripture and develop what we believe about the scripture. He did not require us to believe exactly as he believed. And it, I found it interesting because in that church I grew up in, uh, there were several different doctrinal backgrounds, nothing major, eschatological, a lot of times with the differences. Sometimes a little bit towards Arminianism, sometimes a little bit towards Calvinism. Uh, but out of that church, a tremendous amount of ministers came. Uh, just unbelievable amount of ministers came out of that church and missionaries. Uh, and I can name some of them, but I won't. Uh, one missionary in particular is now pastoring uh, uh, there in the, the Sacramento area. But uh, many in I couldn't name all of them, but just more than the average that you would see coming out of churches. And he promoted this idea that people were responsible to know the scripture. And it resulted in a Bible college there in the church for a long time. Uh, and I hear of men now, one is a song leader at a church that I visit occasionally that, that was in the college there. Another one has written a number of books and uh, pastors a church uh, in the Bay Area now. Uh, but there was a tremendous influence that came out of that, out of that church. And, and it was that he encouraged the men to know and to study for themselves what the scripture taught. And it led to missionaries and pastors and song leaders and people, and perhaps deacons uh, that were in churches, even some of them still living today. And to have his light knowledge and doctrine from him, uh, that we look to the Holy Spirit then to qualify us. Uh, I always talk about coming into the ministry through the back door. Uh, went to seminary uh, not to be a minister. And uh, uh, again, when I got to the fourth year there in Freeport, Louisiana, there was a bunch of preacher boys in that uh, school. And to this day, I only know of two that are actually preaching. Uh, one of them was not there for the ministry. He was there to play ball. <laughs> and the Lord called him into the ministry. Uh, but a number of them uh, professed that they were studying for the ministry and ended up uh, not uh, in the ministry. Some of them not even in church today. And, and so uh, I wanted to know the truth. And I still uh, of that opinion. I still want to know what the scripture teaches. And I strive to study and to know and realize the more I know, the, uh, the more uh, I don't know but also realize that I have to be flexible that when I find that uh, what I thought I knew was not uh, aligned with the scripture, be willing to, to align myself with the scripture. Um, I've often referred to uh, across the country, there'll be what I call clicks and uh, they have a click. Everybody has to be in agreement. And usually there's a, a dominant figure that kind of tells you what that you're supposed to believe and everybody follows that. And I've always tried to be outside of the clicks 
not necessarily pride, but I don't need to be led astray in, in regards to what the scripture teaches because the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. Again, I mentioned a, a, a young man in the prison and I've been amazed at his knowledge of scripture. And he was saved after he came to prison. And I asked him about it. He said, well, when I have a question, I pray about it. And he says, sometimes the Lord shows me uh, the, the question, answers the question for me. Sometimes he'll send someone like another inmate and I'll talk to him about it and I'll have an understanding. And he's come a long ways, uh, uh, speaks perhaps of his intelligence, but also of the fact that the Holy Spirit does instruct us, does teach us. And that's what we look for. We look for the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, that the Holy Spirit guides us, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, the Holy Spirit works regeneration in our hearts and our lives and brings us to a knowledge of our need of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father, and then works salvation in us. But he doesn't leave us there. Uh, as the Lord told his disciples, he'll never leave you. Uh, he says, I must go away, and it's for your benefit that I go away, but the spirit, uh, this comforter will never leave you, uh, that he is there with you. He'll lead you. He'll teach you. He'll instruct you. Uh, he will not leave you in darkness. He will not leave you in a, a lost condition, but he'll bring you from uh, darkness to light. And then he'll continue to lead you along the road uh, till we reach heaven itself. Well, I see that we're just about out of time and I'm going to make a mark here so we can pick up this afternoon this point uh, any thoughts or questions from anybody before we dismiss well we're going to dismiss with a word of prayer then i uh, appreciate everybody joining us tonight i should say today i see i see john brooks i see paul brown senior my sister Ask us to pray that she don't lose her job. She got hurt recently. Uh, I broke, I think, maybe her hand or her arm. Uh, and she's afraid she might lose her job. I see, uh, see Brother Robert Hyman joined us today. And I'm trying to read comments. I'll have to pull it up later, but appreciate you all joining with us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather and worship, to sing your praises. And as we acknowledged earlier, this first day of the week is always the day that we recognize the resurrection, not just one day out of the year, but each Sunday. It's a testimony of the first day of the week that we pull aside to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you deal with us, that you leave us not to ourselves, that you send your spirit. We pray that you bless this afternoon as we meet again to worship you, for it's in thy son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Lord willing, we'll meet again this afternoon at 430. I'm not sure yet if we'll meet here or if we'll be in Henderson. We'll find out here in a little bit. But the Lord bless you until we meet again.